Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha. Welcome to Making Leadership Work. I'm Tim Apicella, filling in for Jay Fidel. Today's episode is titled, Sea Changes at Matson. Matson is the major cargo shipping company here in Hawaii, and also provides numerous other ocean services, of which we're going to talk about in today's show. You know, Matson is such a big part of Hawaii's history, and it's really what keeps the state thriving. But we don't always hear about the new changes that's taking place with Matson. So with us today is Michael Hansen, President of Pacific Maritime Transportation Corporation, and Hawaii Shippers Council to let us know exactly what Matson's up to and what kind of changes are going on. Michael, thank you so much for joining us and I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Tim. I, I'm looking forward to our discussion. Yeah, me too. Um, say, you, uh, you were born and raised here in Hawaii? That's correct. Uh, so tell me a little bit about your background and a little bit about the, um, basically the, the cargo shipment business here in Hawaii. Uh, yeah, I was, uh, born, like I said, born and raised here in Hawaii and uh, went to work uh, at Young Brothers uh, in the early 70s and have been involved one way or another in the maritime business ever since. So I do have some uh, history there. Uh, today's uh, topic is like we discussed, like you introduced, was is gonna be about Matson. Matson is uh, Hawaii's major shipping cup, ocean shipping company. It provides, it carries somewhere between 70 and 80% of the container cargo that arrives here in Hawaii, which is a very significant amount. Their major competitor is uh, Pasha mm -hmm. uh, Hawaii Transport Line, which was formerly Horizon Lines. Uh, that uh, change took place in 2015. Uh, Madsen operates uh, a number of serv several services off the west coast to Hawaii. Uh, they're currently uh, deploying 10 container ships in that service, and they're providing three and a half calls per week at Honolulu Harbor, which is a very high frequency. In addition to that, Madsen operates an inter-island service with container barges and one row row barge where they take the cargo off of the mainline ships arriving from the mainland, mm -hmm. and then transship or relay that cargo to neighbor island ports. And their barges call it... So they, they don't do this at a harbor, they do this in mid-ocean. Negative. Uh, the, lar the mainline ships mm -hmm. come to Honolulu Harbor. Okay. Matson has a major terminal on Sand Island. Right. They call it their Honolulu Container Terminal. There, the mainline ships discharge all of their cargo, or all their cargo bound for Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And then whatever is uh, supposed to go to the neighbor islands then is reloaded onto their in three inner island barges. And those barges operate to Nawiliwili on Kauai, Kahului on Maui, Kauai High, and Hilo on the Big Island. And that's how they distribute the cargo here in Hawaii. What's the frequency of, of these inner island? Oh, it's a re relatively high frequency. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're probably making something on the order of four trips a, a week. Oh, okay. Between the three. The I three didn't realize vessels. it was that many. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because they've got to get, as soon as the ships arrive, the mainline ships arrive mm -hmm. here, they've got to get the cargo out to the neighbor islands. And so if they have 10, what's the frequency that's coming from the mainland to, to Oahu? Uh, three and a half calls per week. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then um, in addition to that, Matson operates what's known as a tra their Trans-Pacific service. Part of that Trans-Pacific service serves Hawaii. The ships go on to Guam and then to Okinawa mm -hmm. and then to two ports in China and then directly back to Los Angeles. That service um, is operated with five container ships and it's part of that of those 10 ships that make that three and a half calls per week at Hawaii. Interesting. And that is, uh, they operate uh, basically Jones Act to Hawaii and to Guam, and then um, to Okinawa, they're operating in what's known as a preference cargo trade. They're carrying U.S. military cargo. I see. Which has a preference for U.S. flagship. Do they also fall under the Jones Act when it comes to American Samoa? 
uh, American Samoa is exempt from the Jones Act. Okay. Uh, American Samoa was made exempt from what's, what's known as maritime cabotage uh, by the Tripart Agreement of 1899 which was between the U.S. It's a long time ago. The, the U.S., uh, Germany, uh -huh. who split the Samoan Islands. Uh, Germany took the western two islands, and, which became ultimate, eventually Western Samoa. America took the, the eastern islands, which became American Samoa. And the third uh, party to that convention was the, was the United Kingdom. And they got a protectorship over Tonga. I see. Okay. And so that agreement. So the old colonia split and divide and conquer actually still serves its function today in today's shipping well, yes. agreements. Yes. And uh, the uh, and as a result of this agreement, they all agreed that they wouldn't uh, impose cabotage on their areas. I'm sorry. What's cabotage mean? Uh, cabotage is uh, the Jones Act is a cabotage law. Oh, okay. Uh, cabotage restricts the um, uh, the transportation uh, uh, within your own domestic sphere, uh, and you can uh, it goes to different degrees. You can have flag cabotage, where you have to have your own flag. You can, in, in the case of the Jones Act, not only does it require a flag, but it requires that the vessel be built in the United States. So, right, and that's. There's four provisions of the Jones Act, and those you just listed two of them. Right. The basic provisions of the Jones Act are the um, vessel has to be built in the United States, a registered vessel of the United States, i.e. the U.S. flag, uh, crewed with um, uh, U.S. citizens and, mm -hmm. of, and some green card holders, right. and uh, it has to be uh, substantially U.S. owned, 75 percent. Right. Those are the basic requirements of the Jones Act. Uh, so the, uh, the service of, from the West Coast that Matson operates with the five container ships to Hawaii and Guam is Jones Act. Going to Okinawa is preference cargo, meaning that the military cargo they're carrying to the, uh, to the bases in Okinawa are uh, required to be carried by a U.S. flag carrier. Then they end up in China. And then from China, uh, the ships make a weekly service directly to Los Angeles mm -hmm. using Great Circle routing. And in that, they're competing with all the large international trans-Pacific carriers. But Matson, because they have small ships, they operate them at a higher speed than the big uh, ships go. And they also uh, ha are able to deliver the cargo on the other end more quickly. So it's called an expedited service. They charge a higher freight rate for this. Well, I mean, if they're getting 80% of the business. To Hawaii. Right. They're not getting 80% of the Trans-Pacific business. OK, gotcha. They're, they're okay. getting maybe Glad 1%. Glad you pointed that out. 1%. <laughs> <laughs> OK, 1%. So from mainland to this our state, um, they're getting 80% of the business. Who's filling in the 20%? Uh, most of it's carried by Pasha. It is Pasha. Okay. And it's somewhere between 70 and 80 percent. Um, when Pasha first, when Horizon Lines was operating, uh, and they were in the neighborhood of around 70, Matson was in the neighborhood of about 70 percent of the cargo, Horizon Lines was about 30 percent of the cargo. Uh, but as the Horizon Lines service deteriorated towards the time that they were forced to sell, uh, and as Pasha picked up after Horizon Lines, there was a deterioration of some of the services. Mm -hmm. And actually, Pasha, when they took over, they abandoned certain, uh, one of the services that uh, Horizon had pre previously operated. I'm going to take a slight left turn here on this discussion because as a consumer, and we all got here somehow, and we all had to have our things shipped here somehow. Sure. We weren't born and raised here for generations. Um, you know, the cost of shipping your car, the cost of putting your, your contents in uh, you know, a container. Um, how are those rates established? Because if, if Horizon has 80% of the cargo business. Matson. Excuse me, Matson. Um, is, there, is there a, a, a formal pricing structure that's regulated, or is it just <clears throat> limited competition on establishing the rates of, of shipping your, your goods and your goods? Well, first of all, it has to be based upon cost of service. Mm -hmm. I mean, sure. they have to make enough money to cover their cost. Uh, and the Jones Act contributes 
uh, a tremendous amount to their cost of service. Okay, so that's incorporated, and that's why we pay. Of course, yeah, yeah. because I mean, we're uh, the to to build a ship, a, a large ship in the United States today, will cost you five times what a comparable ship would in South Korea or Japan. Why is it because we're using our, our labor uh, rates? Uh, uh, rates are, labor rates in Japan are actually higher. Why is it five times more? Because we're inefficient, and we and we construct so few large ships that we don't have any economy of scale. Because our maritime shipping industry is almost. Uh, yeah, the uh, U.S. shipbuilding industry uh, has not been competitive with the rest of the world since the end of the American Civil War. Oh, I, I, I thought you were going to say World War II, but that didn't come out. No. <laughs> okay. The Civil so, War. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a, after the Civil War, uh, there was a movement in the United States to eliminate the build requirement. And uh, that finally fizzled out. But that's still an issue today. Mm -hmm. And it's even more, uh, the costs are even more exaggerated. So today. who's building all the ships in the world today? Uh, uh, Close to 95% of the large ocean-going ships in the world today are constructed in three Asian countries. South Korea's number one, China's number two, and Japan's number three. Is that right? What about oil tankers? Oh, sure. That, Same. Yeah, we're talking container ships, oil ships. tankers, bulk carriers, yeah. any kind of a ship. I didn't know that. Yeah. And I bet a lot of our viewers and <laughs> aren't aware of that. <laughs> and and they, what they've, uh, over time, they've been able to uh, create in North, Northeast Asia, because most of the Chinese shipbuilding is in the, the northeastern part of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, they've got economies of scale working there for steel manufacturing, um, engine manufacturing, and all of the uh, pieces and bits and pieces you need to put together to make a ship. So you've got a concentration in this area of the world with all of these, with all this expertise and all this uh, capacity. And so it becomes very difficult for anywhere else in the world to yeah. begin competing with this. Well, all my synapses are kind of working overtime right now because I'm thinking, you know, there's so many complaints about the high cost of living here in Hawaii. And that's directly, some of that's in part to the cost to ship goods and foods and right. all the equipment and pro yeah. products that we have. According to the federal government, the cost of uh, living in Hawaii is about 18% higher than it is on, than the U.S. average. What percentage of that 18% is could be attributed to the, the Jones Act and the cost of embedding the Jones Act into, um, you know, the, the manufacturing of ships by a U.S. company? Yeah, we're, we're estimating somewhere around 2 to 3%. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And, I mean, the Jones Act is certainly not the uh, cause of all of this. Right. But, but it's but it's a, it's a contributor. Well, you talk to people, they complain about, you know, shipping a car from Los Angeles or Seattle or somewhere on the, you know, on the Pacific coast. and Right. But uh, it, uh, the cost of uh, all of the goods and goods that we purchase here, including uh, materials for construction, mm -hmm. building houses, right. uh, you know, for food and clothing and all that. I didn't realize it costs five times more to build a large ocean-going ship, ship. Okay. in the in the United States than in uh, for a comparable ship. Now we're not, mm -hmm. you know. So the for example, Matson is uh, spending uh, two hundred and fifty-five million dollars to build uh, one ship in San Diego, for example, and that ship might cost in South Korea maybe uh, 50 to 60 million. What do you think it would cost in Japan? Because like you said, a labor cost in Japan is probably comparable to the United States. So what do you think that same ship would cost uh, in Japan, do you think? Probably not too much more. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. And actually, so the labor in South Korea is, is not cheap today. Right. I mean, that's a, that's a fairly high-tech so economy. what's Matson up to right now? I mean, they're expanding their, their routes, are they not? I think you mentioned well, recently uh, that the, they're going to expand uh, out to... Um, one, of the, one of the big things that they've done recently, of course, is something you touched upon, is the Horizon acquisition. Matson acquired the, uh, the ailing Horizon lines. Mm -hmm. Horizon lines basically failed because they had a fleet of very old ships that they could not afford to replace in the United States. And they were operating all Jones Act trades. Uh, Horizon Lines had a service to Hawaii, to uh, Alaska, and to Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. the Puerto Rico service essentially collapsed. And when Matson purchased them in mid-2015, uh, Matson retained Horizon's Alaska service with their three newest vessels, which was a good buy. And they sold to Pasha the Hawaii service. Okay, gotcha. With, with its old vessels. Vessels. Okay. And so Pasha is now stuck uh, with uh, four very old container ships that need to be replaced uh, as soon as possible. But they're facing the very high cost of construction in the United States. Correct. Uh, they have announced uh, last year that they were going to build two new ships at a shipyard in, in Texas. But there's been none of the usual kinds of announcements uh, from the shipyard or from the shipping company that construction has started. Interesting. So we don't really know so what's Mike, going on. So, Mike, hold that thought, because I want to get back to the the far-reaching hand and grasp of Matson, not only from mainland to Hawaii, but also in, sure. in other islands. We're going to take a quick commercial break. I'm Tim Apicelli here with Mike Hansen. We're talking about Matson and, and maritime industry here in Hawaii. We'll be right back. I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just going to scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons. And then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up. And please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. Welcome back. I'm Tim Apicell. I'm here with Mike Hansen. He's president of the Hawaii Shipper, Shippers Council, and we're here talking about Matson and, and maritime industry here in Hawaii. And before the break, we were talking about how um, uh, Matson had purchased Horizon. Uh, they took over the new ships in Alaska service, and they sold the old ships off to Pasha um, in order to what, avoid a, a, right. a uh, monopoly situation, or yeah, uh, Madsen in, in, in the middle of 2015 acquired Horizon Line, which was deep in trouble. Uh, Madsen retained Horizon's Alaska service with their three best newest vessels, and they sold the Hawaii service, including four old steam-driven container ships to Pasha. And the reason that they had to sell the Hawaii service to Pasha is because Madsen already had a dominant position in the Hawaii trade, and they were facing antitrust issues. And so they needed to uh, sell that off to a, to a so to avoid called, the to antitrust, a, the Sherman Act. Uh, yeah, the uh, competitor. So, so what, what point or what percentage does the antitrust um, kick in to say, Matson, you own too much of the of the service and coverage here uh, to Hawaii. Uh, the uh, federal government has been quite uh, 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 okay with Matson having somewhere between seventy and eighty percent of okay. the market. Okay. And uh, if you remember back uh, in the middle of last year, uh, there was a company from Seattle by the name of Saltchuck Resources. Whose, uh, sub, whose subsidiary, Tote, Tote right. attempted to uh, break, in. break into the Hawaii market. And the big fight was over the new container terminal that the state of Hawaii is constructing in Kapalama, in Honolulu Harbor. And uh, there, from what I understand, the agreements had not really been in place for the, for uh, Pasha to, uh, to to acquire the lease to the new container mm -hmm. terminal when it's completed in 2022 or 2023. And so uh, 
Tote uh, attempted to come in. Tote actually, uh, their sister company, uh, Foss Maritime. Foss Maritime, sure. Owns Young Brothers. Okay. So they Got that. they had a presence here. They not only own Young Brothers, but uh, Salt Chuck, the parent, also owns Aloha Cargo. So they've got quite an, a lot of operations here in Hawaii. I'm just, the reason I'm just kind of digging in this one area is because as a consumer, I want to see more shipping companies come out here because ultimately competition is better for pricing. Right. But uh, Tote would be facing this, uh, the same problem that Madsen and, and, and Pasha are facing. They have to build ships in the United States. Okay, so the Jones Act affects so, every shipping company no matter what. Every shipping company yeah. that chooses to operate in a domestic service. Uh, some, uh, in order to reduce the cost of shipping, you need to reduce the cost of the capital investment in shipping, which is the vessels. Right. And uh, That's not going to happen. <laughs> well, there's, uh, who knows what's going to happen. But. Do you ever think, I, I, I know the show wasn't geared towards the Jones Act, but do you ever think there's ever going to be an opportunity in the near future or even distant future about some, um, maybe amendments to the Jones Act that well, may yeah, help? I mean, uh, People think that the Jones Act is just one law, but actually it's, it's, a, it's a, a series of laws which uh, come under the rubric of maritime cabotage. And the, the Jones Act is, there's no such law known in the, on the law books as Jones Act. That's I a, see. Okay, that's a misnomer. I didn't know that. Yeah, that, it's, a, it's a popular name. Yeah, so people... Take a whole conglomerate of different <laughs> laws and just say the Jones Act, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's good to know. Thank and, you. And uh, uh, the Jones Act can actually refer to Section 27 of the Merchant Marine Act of 1920 as amended. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're using Jones Act in its strictest usage, that's it. Okay. But most people uh, don't. Most people refer to all of the maritime cabotage laws, regulations, and even judicial rulings as the Jones Act. Gotcha. What happened in 1920 to prompt this, these laws <laughs> uh, to kind of come well, into place? Uh, some of the, uh, the right law, after World War I. Yeah, but some of the laws that we refer to as Jones Act laws mm -hmm. uh, precede my, the uh, turn of the century. Okay. For example, the Passenger Services Vessel Act, Passenger Vessel Services Act, is um, 1885, I think it is. So, <laughs> if they go back a long ways, what the, what the um, Section 27 of the Merchant Marine Act of 1920 did is it restated a number of laws that went back to the first Congress of the United States after enactment of, or after ratification of the Constitution. You know what I like about Think Tech Hawaii? We come up with guests like you that <laughs> really can fill in the blanks and, you know, and help us, you know, the residents but, here in this island to really understand things and the, a little and better. The, and the reason that uh, it came about in 1920 mm -hmm. is because during World War I, so many ships had been requisitioned for the war effort that there were exceptions made. And for example, foreign flag ships were allowed to carry passengers and cargo between Hawaii and the West Coast. Uh -huh. And um, there was also another law that had allowed foreign built vessels to come into the U.S. flag fleet. And so the 1920 law was uh, one of its purposes was to close all those loopholes. Gotcha. Um, with the advent of jet engines and you know the 707, the Boeing 707, how long did it take for passenger, tourist passenger ship uh, service to kind of just not be uh, profitable and just kind of go away? Uh, not very long at all. Was it a couple of years or? Um, years? I mean, I, I was- So TWA, Pan Am, they really just killed the Matson tourist shipping market. Yeah, I think the mat, regularly scheduled Matson um, sh uh, passenger ships between here and the West Coast ended around 1970. Oh, okay. That, oh, I didn't realize it extended that late. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, of course, the uh, wide-body jets came in during the 60s. Right, 67, 66, you know, somewhere in there. But it didn't, it wasn't very long. I mean, yeah. it took, you know, uh, maybe 10 years 
and uh, the passenger ship business was gone. Yeah. You recently just wrote uh, an article about uh, Matson extending service to Tahiti. Right. Uh, Matson started in uh, 2016, I believe it is, a service that they called the South Pacific Express. And what it does, it operates from Honolulu, from Matson's terminal on Sand Island, in a similar way that the barge services do to the neighbor islands. Okay. What they're trying to do is extend is to uh, get more sh cargo on their mainline ships from the mainland to Hawaii, and then use the terminal, which is a large, efficient operation there, to put the cargo on foreign flag ships. And, oh, okay. And, and operate from uh, Honolulu Harbor. Mm -hmm. uh, they've, this is the third iteration of their service, South Pacific Express service. And it's, I think the jury's probably still out on whether or not it's going to work. Is this them. going to be, is this good for, for Tahiti? Is this good for Hawaii? Uh, well, there's existing services off the West Coast yeah. directly to Tahiti and Samoa. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's in competition with those other services. Mm -hmm. And those other services are operated by quite large international shipping companies. So the competition is probably very, quite uh, fierce. And whether Madsen can make this work or not is yeah. still up in the air. But they operate from Hawaii to uh, the latest iteration is uh, two ships operating what's called a fortnightly service or every two weeks. Two weeks, weeks or, yeah. Uh, to if you study Shakespeare, you'll know what a fortnight is. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of the world uses the term fortnight, and it's used widely in the ship international oh, okay. shipping business. <laughs> but if you say that to an American, they go, what's, what's that? that? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, the current uh, routing is, is uh, Honolulu, Papayete, mm -hmm. uh, Pongo Pongo in American Samoa, Apia in what used to be called Western Samoa, and now is West, just Samoa Plain. And then to Nuku'alofa in Tonga, and then Honolulu. Okay. Well, guess what? We've run out of time. Oh. <laughs> and <laughs> I know there's a lot more on that page that we can get to, and I hope you come back again. Oh, yeah. And, uh, well, thanks for the history lesson. I just had no idea. And, um, again, that's one of the nice things about Think Tech Hawaii is that we bring guests like you, and you can really uh, educate us and, and make us, makes our, makes us far more knowledgeable about what's going on. Oh, yeah. So, Thank I enjoyed for, it. Thank you, Tim. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Okay. This is Tim Apicella, and aloha.